Hello and welcome back to my channel. So good to have you here. Do you like my my dying plant? I don't know what's wrong with it. I saw it wilting, so I tried watering it and then it kept on wilting, so I thought maybe it's overwatered, so then I didn't water it and it kept on wilting, so now I'm thinking maybe it's underwatered, but I don't know what the problem is. Poor thing. Poor thing. We're gonna jump back in with Marie Antoinette. I filmed about two hours of footage several months ago for this series, and I've finally come to the end of it. And I'm glad because I'm getting kind of sick of this series. I mean, I'm not gonna be done with it forever, but I'm gonna take some time off because I'm tired of it. So let's get back in with that. Ever since that incident, I've been trying to find that mysterious man again in Versailles, but to no avail. It's soon the day of the opera performance, and waking up, I head over to the opera theater together with Gabrielle. Mary has always been interested in opera music. She even had a small theater built so she can perform pieces at any time. Apart from providing her and her friends a place to enjoy music, it is also a venue for staging performances. The audience usually consists of the king and aristocrats. Today's piece is titled Salzburg's Edelweiss, set in Austria, and composed by Marie with a number of other enthusiasts. Okay, I know what the what Edelweiss is. I'm trying to figure out if this is an actual song from the time or if they're just going to be singing Edelweiss from uh, uh, Sound of Music. I forgot to record this segment when I still had my filming setup up, so I'm just holding the camera by hand. Uh, I can find no evidence that this was an actual song from the time. When I've looked up Salzburg's Edelweiss, they didn't give me a whole lot of information to go on, just the title. All I could find was Edelweiss from Sound of Music being performed in Salzburg. So, as far as I can tell, not real. Marie, you should get changed for the performance. We shouldn't keep the Austrian musicians and actors waiting. They've come a long way. From, from Austria? Yes, I know. All the performers today are from my motherland, and I'm overjoyed at the thought of seeing them. You seem really happy today. Inviting them from your homeland was the right decision. Yes, I'm so glad. I should get changed now. Let's not make them wait for too long. Gabrielle accompanies me to the changing room, and I start prepping for the performance. Oh, we got new hair. That's interesting. It looks quite 18th century from the back, and it's got these buckles here on the side. Just this side swoop is not 18th century. If it had all of these buckles and this part that swooped off to the side just kind of went back and like that, then it would actually be quite accurate. Of course, I need not tell you that these sunglasses are 100% accurate for uh, 1785 when this takes place. Oh, oh. It is long. That's a plus. It looks like she's wearing some sort of Carico jacket. This ruffly thing around the collar could even be a Brunswick hood. I'll put a picture of what I'm talking about on screen. Ooh, now coming around to the back, this looks like it could be uh, inspired by the sack back, the, the robe à la française. They had this interesting way of doing the pleats in the back of the dress, so they flowed out like this. It didn't really look anything like this, but it could be inspired by that. On a scale of one to an actual dress from 1785, I'm putting this at a two, so not very high. The green one that I usually put her in is a five. The rest of the dresses that we've seen so far are a point five. <laughs> So this is better than, than most of them are, but still not very good. Marie, you look amazing. I love the way the colors match on your outfit. You remind me of the way you looked when you first arrived in Versailles as a 14 year old child. I asked Leonard to make, oh, I asked Leonard to make this for me, inspired by Austrian clothing and incorporated two of my favorite colors. Looking at my reflection, joy and nostalgia well up within me bringing with them memories of Austria's beautiful scenery. Backstage, the atmosphere is heavy and tense. Looking around, I notice that not all the performers are here. A few of them are missing. What happened? Okay, now, now let's look at what this woman is wearing because that is quite accurate. The hairstyle that she's got is called a hedgehog style. And it is, it was very, very popular in the 1780s. I can't remember what this, uh, style of front is on her dress, but it has a specific style and I will put it on screen and show you other examples of 18th century dresses that had front 
things kind of coming down like that in an A shape. I'm impressed. And I really like that shade of green. I, well, they fell ill and are unable to come. Several of the performers are unable to meet my gaze and hang their heads. I have a bad feeling about this. I hope that the missing people are really just sick. Really just sick as opposed to what? Dead? Once I've made the necessary arrangements for the back up performers, I go on stage and I quietly pray that everything will go smoothly. The curtains go up and I let out a cry of surprise. There's no one in the audience. Hearing me, Gabrielle hurries to my side. She's stunned by the empty theater. The king did send out the invitations. Everyone should be here and the king has never been late. Oh, that was Gabrielle. I didn't do her voice, sorry. Something must have happened. Halt the performance. I must find out what's wrong. Once I've changed back into my formal attire, I hurry back into the palace. The minute I arrive, I hear news that the king urgently wishes to see me. Louis XVI wants us to hurry to the study immediately. Why and for what purpose? I step into the study. The eyes are all on me. They are filled with anger, suspicion, contempt. The aristocrats and ministers do not bother to hide their feelings, and it feels like I have been stabbed by a hundred knives. Only two pairs of eyes give me some relief, like a ray of hope in the darkness. Fersen's gentle, loving gaze and Lafayette's sincere and determined eyes. Seeing them, I heave a small sigh of relief, curtsy, and then look up at the king. Uh, my queen, there is a merchant here who says you asked Cardinal Roan to help you buy that necklace and that the item has already been handed over, but he has not received payment. Rumors have spread across the land, and the people are saying that the royal court is robbing merchants and will soon be robbing them. Did you not say this was a misunderstanding? I believed you, and I even asked Lafayette to help clear your name. But now the merchant has come seeking payment. How do you explain this? The sparkling diamond necklace appears in my mind's eye again. But now all the sparkles are as sharp as needles. That's very poetical. I look at the pitiful, sobbing Bomer, and I'm overcome with rage. Necklace? Why is it all about that necklace again? You promised me that the rumors would die off. You would be my witness and prove to everyone that I didn't buy that darned necklace from you. But not only have you broken your promise, you have concocted a wild story to frame me. Your Majesty, please help me. I am but a merchant. I do not dare go against the Queen. That necklace is incredibly valuable. I would not have handed it over had Cardinal Roan not claimed that the Queen had asked him to help him purchase it. I just want what is owed me. Many years of hard work and went into crafting that necklace. Roan? Everyone knows that I've never forgiven him for insulting my mother. Why would he, I ask him to help me? I've got to say, I'm on the edge of my seat here. With anything. <laughs> I've already made a promise to the king. Why would I want that necklace now? It's true. You wrote a letter to the cardinal to ask him to buy the necklace. I saw it myself. I wouldn't have dared to give the necklace to the cardinal if it weren't for the status of the royal court. I have never written such a letter. If you really have something like that, show it. Did you not write the letter, Your Majesty? If I actually had the letter in my possession, I would not be here. Everything is pointing back at me. I feel so helpless. I do not know what else I can say or do. I didn't do the deed. That makes it sound very ominous. I didn't do the deed. Why do I have to keep proving my innocence? I have to prove that I didn't buy that necklace that I've already changed, that I'm worthy of the king's trust. Your Majesty, I am innocent. Please believe me. Louis XVI avoids my gaze. He does not reply to me, but his gesture already signals that he does not trust me. <sighs> my queen, this time it is no longer about whether I believe you. Whatever trust there was between the king, oh, whatever trust there was between the king and I seems to have vanished along with that little sigh. I'm not sure it did. I feel like he said it doesn't really matter anymore whether or not he trusts you. It's about what the people think. Now I feel icy cold, as though a wintry wind has blown right through me. I'm chilled to the bone and frozen in place. Yes, he is a king before he is my husband, but I mustn't give up. 
I'll do my best to defend myself. Your Majesty, why do you say that? Perhaps we can clear my name once more. Louis the Sixteenth looks wearily at Lafayette. Lafayette gets the hint and addresses me sternly. This isn't like the last time. It's a lot more serious now. We can't just put a stop to the rumors. There's malicious talk all over the kingdom, and it's spreading like wildfire. The issue with the necklace has caused the people to call you Madame Deficit, and they're clamoring to have you sent back to Austria. Okay, so she actually was called Madame Deficit at this time, not only because of the affair of the necklace, although that was part of it, but she was accused of spending France into ruin. Now, more than anything that Marie Antoinette did on buying silks and jewels was the vast amount of money that France poured into helping with the American Revolution. That was the cause of the deficit, not Marie Antoinette, who she spent a lot of money, but it, compared to the immense amount of money that the French poured into the American Revolution, that was just a drop in the bucket. What? I've already tried so hard and yet this is happening. Is it impossible to change history? No, I refuse to give in. I take a few deep breaths and force myself to calm down. This is not a time to panic. I must think of a solution, a way to preserve my life. Just as I'm struggling with myself, Furson stands up, sweeps his eyes across all who are present and speaks. France has been accumulating debts ever since... <laughs> France has been accumulating debts ever since Louis the Fifteenth, and with the war on top of that, the people have lost their faith in the monarchy. So he's not wrong. I would still be wary about saying that directly to the king's face, but he's not wrong. And this necklace that is causing so much hoo-ha. <laughs> it's just not the word I would have used. And this necklace that is causing so much hoo-ha also appears to be one that Louis the Fifteenth commissioned for Madame de Berry, and now all the troubles are being pushed upon the Queen. Count Furson, please watch your words. I'm not trying to accuse Louis the Fifteenth of anything. My point is, blaming the Queen for this mess won't help the situation at all. What we should focus on now is find is to find out exactly what happened. That's the only way to solve the current crisis. Okay. Finally, Furson has said something good. <laughs> Thank you, Furson. You're right. I cannot believe I said that, but I actually like him. In this one specific instance, he's still a creep in the rest of the instances. The room is suddenly filled with the sound of people whispering to one another. From the way they keep glancing at me and Furson, I'm sure they're gossiping about my relationship with him. They don't care about my innocence at all. I'm just about to despair. Lafayette moves to Furson's side and regards everyone with a steely gaze. I agree with Count Furson. As of the moment, apart from the merchant's words, we have not seen any proof nor any witnesses. The Queen says that she does not have the necklace. Then where is the necklace? As for the letter that Bomer mentioned, where is it? I think that we should investigate the matter right away and make sure that justice is served for the Queen's sake as well as for France. Good idea. I'm sure glad that there was a man there to come up with it. You are right. Now that things no longer seem as dire, my legs turn to jelly. What? Now that things no longer seem as dire, my legs turn to jelly, and I almost fall over. But Lafayette can't handle this again, or the people may think ill of him, and things might get worse. I will ask an experienced minister named Blaisdell to handle the investigation. We shall investigate the authenticity of the letter, the necklace's whereabouts, and find all who are involved. We must find out the truth. <sighs> Sharp as a brick. My queen, are you agreeable to this arrangement? Blaisdell is my most trusted minister. He is meticulous in his work and has always done what is best for France and the royal family. The people of France don't respect me as Queen of France, but think of me as a frivolous princess from Austria. I mean, if the shoe fits. Blaisdell won't regard my reputation as a top priority. He'll probably do what's best for the royal family as a whole. And you see that as a bad thing? My choice will affect me greatly, and it might change my fate and the fate of France. Should I agree to letting Blaisdell handle the investigations? 
All right, so this guy, Blaisdell, is entirely fictional. He did not exist. He's supposedly the interior minister of France, but France didn't have interior ministers until after the revolution. So he's entirely fictional. That makes me think I should say no, disagree, because he's not real. But I think if I disagree, they're not going to say, okay, well, now we can uh, have, you know, the actual person who investigated it do it, because I, I don't I haven't been able to find out who actually investigated this, so I might not be known. And I also think that just what would Marie Antoinette have done in this situation? Because she was in a situation very much like this. And I think that she would have known at the time that it would behoove her to agree with everything that the king wanted, <laughs> quite frankly. So I'm kind of almost thinking that I should say agree, even though the guy is not real. If I could, I wish I could take part in, in the investigations myself, even if I cannot change my fate, at least I'd find out the truth. Okay, this is making me feel very glad that I said agree, because this seems like it's hinting that if I'd said disagree, then she would have led the investigation, which definitely did not happen. So this does seem to be the more accurate of the two paths. If any of you have played this and have said disagree, then let me know what would have happened, and maybe I'll be kicking myself because the more accurate thing would have happened, I don't know. But based on this, I think I made the right choice. But if I do that and go against the king's decision, will I offend him? Probably. I don't know if I should trust Blaisdell, but I seem to have no other choice. I can only quietly hope that the results will prove my innocence and grant me justice. I shall trust your majesty's judgment. Is that so? That's good. The king and all the aristocrats and ministers present seem to relax a great deal, but Furson's brow remains furrowed. I still feel that I can't just stand by and do nothing. This involves my well-being, after all. If you, if I can do something, anything, to help the king and the royal family, I am willing to give it my all. Mary, I understand how you feel. I was too hasty just now, and I didn't mean to treat you that way. But in order to convince everyone, I must investigate everyone, including you. The process might discomfort you, but that is something that cannot be avoided. I will make sure the truth comes to light as soon as possible, and that no one is falsely accused, especially you. Mary, please believe me. His earnestness is so appealing that I am unable to utter any words of disagreement. After a brief moment of hesitation, I curtsy. Very well then, your majesty. I shall hand this over to you. Blaisdell, please handle the matter and submit progress reports to me. And he looks exactly like Lafayette. Like, exactly like him. Oh, he said, yes, your majesty. Yes, your majesty. Oh, wait, since Cardinal Roan is involved, I think it's best to let the queen and I handle that part of the interrogation. Let us see him together. With your majesty's presence, I am sure that we will be able to get a just result. Please allow me to prepare for the visit. Okay, I hope this is over. I'm getting kind of a sore throat. I've been filming for two hours. The king has given me his promise, and things are moving along, but there is a lingering shadow of doom within me. The matter that I thought was already solved has emerged again in a worse form than before, so I can't help but feel that no matter how hard I try, I won't be able to escape an execution. Well, Marie, I'm working really hard to make sure you don't escape that execution, because I really want her to die at the end of this. Thank you so much for watching this video. A huge, huge thank you to Mary Royal, Kit Kat Stitch, Sandra White, Emily Donnelly, V. Birchwood, Kiara Craft, Patricia Bentley, The Turtle Moves, and Amanda Martin for sponsoring this channel on Patreon. If you'd also like to sponsor this channel on Patreon, I'll leave a link in the description. No hard feelings if you can't. But there will be hard feelings if you don't follow me on Instagram, because that's free. So I'm going to link to that down below as well. And I will also link to my, or leave my email address down there if you want to get in touch with me for any reason. We're coming up on that time of year again, by which I mean the finals time of year, which means that I have not a ton of free time. So I'm not going to stop posting for this part of the year like I did at this time last year. I think I'm just going to be posting shorts until the kind of middle of December. And then I will get back into the regularly scheduled programming. I'm going to try to make my first video after finals be the kind of follow up to my viral video about Mrs. 1896 Housewife, because there are a lot of questions on that video that I would like to answer. So 
that is the plan and I look forward to seeing you again next time. Bye-bye.